Good day and welcome to CDI Talks. My name is Anton Shekhovsov and I'm the chair of the Center for Democratic Integrity, an Austria-based association that analyzes attempts of authoritarian regimes to influence politics and societies in Europe. My guest today is the Swedish political scientist Bjorn Jarden, whose research covers international relations in the Asia-Pacific, with a particular focus on China's international relations. From 2016 to 2020, Bjorn was the head of the Asia program at the Swedish Institute of International Affairs. Since 2020, he has been the director of the Swedish National China Center. Bjorn now also participates in the European Think Tank Network on China and is a member of the steering group of the Stockholm Observatory for Global China. I hope you will find our conversation interesting and if you do, please like this video and subscribe to our YouTube channel to stay updated on future episodes of CDI Talks. Bjorn, thank you very much for meeting me and for this opportunity to talk to you. Uh, I would like to ask you about the sanctions. I know that you were one of the 10 people who were sanctioned by China uh, a year ago and one of the two scholars who were, sanctions by, uh, who were sanctioned by China. How do you explain this? What, what is the owner of, of the Chinese government to, to sanction you? What did you do the, to them? Well, uh, what's uh, difficult when it comes to Chinese sanctions compared to, for example, EU sanction or sanctions from the United States government is that uh, the Chinese authorities haven't really provided any detailed explanation or justification why they sanction certain people. Uh, so it's a bit difficult to know uh, exactly why I was put on this list. Some other people, other scholars on the list have been working a lot on the human rights abuses in Xinjiang. I haven't really done that, but of course uh, in my role as a scholar and also uh, working at a think tank in Stockholm, I've been writing things, saying things and also perhaps meeting people. Uh, and uh, the Chinese government might have opinions about that, but they haven't told me exactly what I did that uh, uh, was a cause for these sanctions. I think in one of your pieces you mentioned that uh, it was quite strange for Sweden to have good, so good relations with China, knowing that China is was, you know, abusing human rights. And especially for Sweden, that mm -hmm. presents itself as the champion of, of human rights. Mm -hmm. um, do you still see that this is probably how the changes in the perceptions of China started? This realization that China was not a very, you know, um, uh, well-behaving uh, nation? Mm. I, th that's a really good question and I think in uh, Swedish foreign policy in general there's always been a tension about on the one hand human rights concerns and on the other hand economic interests since Sweden is also a big trading nation and as a big trading nation we trade with not only democracies but also non-democratic countries such as China so that tension ha has always been there. Uh, but at the same time, we, we can see that concerns about the worsening human rights situation in China seems to have had an impact on how the Swedish population and also Swedish policymakers think about China. We can also see signs of this in opinion research when we compare um, opinion service in Sweden with opinion service in other countries asking questions about China, it seems that human rights is a pretty important factor in Sweden when it comes to forming views about China. Uh, you mentioned 2018-2019 when you think that these changes uh, started to appear mm -hmm. and also these, this is the period of time that you described in one of the pieces that you co-authored mm -hmm. about, um, about an incident with uh, Chinese tourists in mm -hmm. Stockholm. Can you, t can you tell us about this uh, episode, this incident? Yeah, well it, it was a pretty peculiar incident and it was a family of Chinese tourists that arrived at a hotel in Stockholm, but they arrived one day earlier. So the booking was for the next day, but this was late at night. So uh, apparently they wanted to stay in the lobby of the hotel, but the staff at the hotel didn't think that was a good idea. And uh, this led to an argument and eventually the police came to evacuate these Chinese tourists from the premises. Um, and initially nothing more happened, but then later a video emerged on Chinese social media showing the police evacuating these tourists. And this led to a lot of 
protests on Chinese social media, but also from the Chinese foreign ministry. And uh, what conclusions would you draw from those incident and from that incident and from the scandals around it that the Chinese media and the Chinese embassy, mm -hmm. as far as I know, they they created? Still, at least to my knowledge, we don't really know the exact origins of this incident and how it emerged on Chinese social media. But it seems pretty clear that the Chinese authorities use this incident strategically in order to criticize the Swedish government and what they described as problems when it came to Sweden's human rights situation, not respecting the rights of these tourists. And I think it's important also to understand the context here because we have a case uh, of a Swedish citizen. Uh, his name is Guay Min Hai and he was uh, kidnapped from his holiday home in Thailand and then brought to China and he's been in jail in China since, since 2015. And when this incident happened in 2018, uh, he had been released from prison in China earlier the same year, but then while traveling with Swedish diplomats in a train toward Beijing, Chinese security personnel entered the train and took him away. So at the time, this was a serious diplomatic incident. And then this tourism incident happened and it might have been a way for the Chinese side to shift the focus and go in order to go on the offensive and criticize the Swedish government for their alleged human rights deficiencies. Sometimes it seems that the Chinese authorities and uh, the operators of Chinese influence, they they learn from from the Russians and especially and this is something that you mentioned that they started talking about human rights in Sweden mm -hmm. and sometimes uh, it seems that they are learning this language of human rights they are learning the uh, language of democracy of democracies of, of liberalism in order to attack uh, those countries mm -hmm. Uh, that criticized China for the abuse of human rights, mm -hmm. for the treating of the Uyghurs minority. Mm -hmm. uh, do you see any, you know, this learning procedure that, mm -hmm. that the Chinese are learning from Russia? I, I think it's pretty difficult to know exactly how they are learning. I think still uh, their modes of operation is often quite different from that of Russia. I think one other um, difference is that uh, within Russia there is generally a much more fine-tuned understanding of the societal and cultural and political context in European countries which make it possible to uh, design uh, perhaps more effective influence operations toward uh, a larger public. Uh, I think in China there's all, uh, still uh, uh, often a lack of that kind of fine-tuned understanding of the situation in European countries which, which might make it difficult to conduct uh, influence operations that turn out to be successful. Uh, the incident you uh, described mm. uh, took place in 2018. Mm. 2018 was also, I think, the continuation of that uh, anti-Swedish campaign. Yeah. What about today? Mm. How, how active mm. is China uh, in Sweden today mm. in terms of you know, malign influence and promoting its own foreign policy uh, agenda? Right. For a few years we uh, witnessed a very active, sustained public campaign to influence the uh, Swedish opinion uh, of China. It seems that that specific campaign has ended now, or at least has been adapted. And that also connects with the fact that the former Swedish, um, f sorry, the former Chinese ambassador to Sweden, who had a very prominent role in this campaign, left Sweden last year. And the new Chinese ambassador seems to have a different style of conducting public relations. He behaves more like a traditional diplomat, to put it in that way. At the same time, we've seen other actions uh, from China towards Sweden and also targeting uh, the Swedish private sector 
last year it was a boycott in China toward the Swedish fashion retail company H&M initiated by the Chinese government and this has severely hurt H&M uh, the company sales in China and we don't exactly know why H&M was targeted then uh, it might have something to do with the fact that H&M is a Swedish company also after uh, Sweden decided to deny uh, Chinese companies including Huawei the uh, possibility to contribute with technology to the development of Sweden's 5G development we have seen difficulties for another Swedish company, Ericsson, mm -hmm. uh, working in the same sector in China. So we've seen those kind of effects on Swedish company uh, in the last year, but this large scale public relations campaign in Sweden seems to have ended or entered into a new phase. It seems that uh, the, the Chinese embassy uh, is the main player uh, in you know advancing Chinese uh, interests in uh, at least in Sweden, mm -hmm. what about other actors though? Mm -hmm. uh, do they have uh, you know uh, institutes active here in Sweden, mm -hmm. or do they have any other organizations that would be involved or engaged in uh, malign influence operations? We have organizations that are connected to the so-called United Front work of the Chinese government. Uh, organizations that uh, promote uh, the interests of the Chinese Communist Party. We had instances in the past in Sweden where uh, people in Sweden spied on the behalf of the Swedish government on Tibetan and Uyghur diaspora communities in, uh, in Sweden. Um, and the Swedish security service also reports on uh, widespread uh, espionage activities from the Chinese government. So we know that those kind of activities are, are, also, uh, uh, are also seen in Sweden. No influence is ever successful without actors who help you know, foreign powers, foreign uh, organizations, foreign uh, stakeholders mm -hmm. to spread that influence. Mm -hmm. Do you see any, you know, enablers, domestic enablers of uh, Chinese influence in Sweden? If we're talking about actors that actively are enabling uh, Chinese messages in Sweden, we, we have those, but they are very marginalized. They are very marginalized. And those? It, it includes some think tanks, uh, political activists uh, that are working closely with the Chinese authorities to promote messages including uh, the uh, uh, promotion of the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative and so on. But uh, those actors have no real following in Sweden. So I think their impact on the larger public opinion in Sweden about China and issues related to China is close to non-existent. And I think one reason for Chinese authorities to work with these actors is that uh, the opinion has become so negative in Sweden toward China, so it's difficult for them to find more established actors that are willing to enter into cooperation with China. One example is that in Sweden we've seen Another trend also in the last few years that Swedish local governments in the municipalities and regions, a lot of them who used to have cooperation agreements with Chinese counterparts, so-called sister cities or twinning agreements, a lot of those municipalities and regions have decided to end those agreements because of negative sentiment about China. So, at the moment, working with established actors to uh, influence the public debate in Sweden has become very difficult and challenging for Chinese government actors. So would you, would you describe the, um, the approaches, uh, uh, Swedish approaches to China, or at least official uh, Swedish approaches to China as sort of resilient towards uh, Chinese influence and towards Chinese narratives? Uh, I think if we talk about not only the Swedish government, but also the Swedish civil society, Swedish media, 
I, I think so. Uh, I think that the experiment, so to speak, that we have seen now in the last few years, and especially between 2018 and 2020, of a very active large-scale influence campaign uh, in Sweden, I think that civil society and media handled that quite well. But then it means that this campaign, this, uh, the campaign that the embassy and the government uh, of yeah. China were uh, involved in, it sort of backfired in Sweden. Mm. I, I think it did. I think it did because we also have evidence from opinion service that during the exact same time, Swedish public opinion of China became much worse. Swedes became much more negative toward the Chinese government. And I think the consensus here is that this campaign in itself had not a small part in this. So in th that sense, it's backfired. It made Swedes more negative toward cooperating with China rather than the opposite. Uh, what's, in your opinion, what's the future of uh, Chinese influence in, uh, in Sweden? Uh, so I think the direct Chinese influence on public opinion is quite limited, but that doesn't mean that China has no influence. So I think China's biggest source of influence on Sweden is rather economic dependencies. Uh, what are those? Sweden trades quite a lot with China. There are many big Swedish companies with significant interests in China. But we also have big Chinese investments in Sweden. Volvo Cars mm -hmm. is a Chinese company. It's owned by China. So in Western Sweden, uh, a Chinese company is the biggest private employer. As a matter of fact, it's the biggest private employer in the whole of Sweden. So I think this kind of dependency is the biggest source of influence for China in Sweden. And that doesn't mean that uh, Swedes will become more positive about China, but there is a sense that China has a leverage there and um, that it can use as well. But it means that they should also have some backing from political forces by people who are in power in Sweden. I think the consensus among politicians in Sweden is that we should continue to trade with China. Uh, at the same time, more or less all political parties in Sweden has become more negative about China. And I also think there's a growing realization that too much dependency of China can be uh, risky and negative. So I think the common sentiment in Sweden is moving in a direction not of decoupling from China, but in a direction of trying to find ways to decrease uh, some of the dependencies that we have. Uh, in your observations of uh, China and its activities in Sweden, do you see any changes in their behavior or in their narratives mm -hmm. against the background of Russia's war against Ukraine? Mm -hmm. Have they become more active because of these developments? I'm not sure they have become more active, but I think that China stands, especially when it comes to uh, Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine, already had quite a negative influence uh, on China's image in Europe. Uh, I think it's uh, very difficult, if not impossible, for the Chinese government to convincingly explain to European publics why they haven't criticized Russia's actions. Uh, I think it's extremely important to increase efforts to create Europe-wide conversations about China, whether among policymakers, among uh, universities, think tanks, media, and so on. Uh, because without this common understanding of China, it will be difficult to maintain a common policy stance. I, I fully agree with you that it's important to have this uh, more robust network of think tanks mm -hmm. and institutions working on China. Yeah. And I really hope that uh, your center mm -hmm. um, will provide this expertise uh, and you know, work more with other organizations. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wish you all the best in this endeavor. And thank you very much for the conversation. Thank you, Anton. Pleasure talking to you.